good afternoon again. My name is April Motley. It is two o'clock on the dot. So we'll officially kick off our first I Am Online of the year. Um, welcome and thank you for joining. Uh, this afternoon's topic is the year ahead in IAM. Uh, and we are joined by um, the Common Catalyst and Ann West will be serving as our moderator. Uh, before I turn uh, things over to Ann, I do want to give you all a couple of reminders. Uh, about um, this afternoon. Uh, so uh, we will be recording this afternoon's presentation. You will receive the slides and the recording uh, sometime later this week or next week. Rest assured, we are recording and you will have access to that information. Also want to let you know that we are using Zoom, the, the Q&A function in Zoom, uh, for our questions. So if you would submit your questions using that function, you're welcome to use chat throughout the presentation uh, to interact with each other. Um, and I also will be monitoring the chat uh, in case there are any questions there uh, about logistics or for our speakers. But we do encourage you to use the Zoom Q&A function to answer your questions. Uh, and we do have a full afternoon for you. So we will have Q&A uh, after all of the presentations are completed. Um, with that, I will turn things over to our moderator for this afternoon, uh, Ann West, our Associate Vice President for Trust and Identity. Thank you. Hi, thanks, April, and welcome, everybody. Um, just want to say hello from uh, Denver, Colorado. We're in the middle of the National Western Stock Show here, and um, things are pretty crazy when the Longhorns are running down the uh, street in front of your building. So uh, if you get a chance to catch it, it's really a, kind of a fun thing. So uh, welcome. Uh, we're going to talk our first I am of the year with our In Common Catalysts. And uh, as April said, uh, here are a few reminders that she's already mentioned. Um, and let's do a few introductions. For the first thing, I want to give you a little bit of background about what the In Common Catalyst program is about. Um, we're really we're going to hear seven from seven of the nine Catalyst partners and their organizations, uh, companies, and nonprofit organizations that provide uh, contract hosting, support, integration options for the In Common Trusted Access Platform and Common Federation and help with identity and access management writ large across research and education. So what's special about a catalyst, um, I think is really their mission for the most part uh, is focused on research and education. Um, many of them came out of colleges and universities and went on to establish valuable companies um, to address gaps that they saw as identity and access management practitioners. They also uh, participate in our advisory groups, our working groups, and contribute back to the community in the form of code, um, volunteer hours, uh, requirements, uh, work with the community, uh, internship programs, and the like. And finally, their products and services support the in common community standards. So why is this important to you? What, what makes a difference? Why is a catalyst different? And I think mission focus is one. They aren't designing products and services for another sector and then selling it in education. They're actually seeing the academic mission and using the academic mission and establishing their uh, company um, basis of the academic mission is, is key. Uh, for what they are contributing to in their business model. We keep them close, and because of that participation in the working groups and the advisory groups, they have a lot of insight into plans, implementations, um, ideas that others, uh, other companies may not have. So they can add to your team, provide uh, support, um, and actually uh, augment your staff, they can provide hosted services, as I mentioned, integration services from your environment. And because they're in on the ground floor on the uh, community projects, as well as the Catalyst program, they can address the community needs faster and in a more uh, integrated and um, uh, participatory way. So um, with that, I'm gonna introduce quickly today's speakers. Uh, and we'll be cycling through each one in the six minute lightning talks that we have today. Uh, 
So each of these speakers will be taking a, a trend that they believe is uh, important in the next in the next year, excuse me, and then uh, providing a little bit of background about why and how they contribute to that. So the first one will be uh, Jim Basney uh, from CI Logon. Jim is the principal research scientist, and he wears many hats in the research space in the in the, for instance, in trusted CI. Next one will be Evolvium with Simona Sim Simkova, who's a sales representative. We also have other um, technical folks on the call from Evolvium in case there are further questions. We have Moran Technology with Jim Van Vandalem. He's the senior consultant with Moran. Stefan Fox, software engineer, senior software engineer with Provision IM, who will be primarily supporting and primarily supports Midpoint. And then Sharice Arrowood, Executive Director of Business Development at Unicon, and Nada Caligari, Community Lead at Westeret. And without further ado, uh, Jim. Oh, here's our format for today's webinar. We've already talked about that. And let's go to Jim, Science Projects Migrating to JSON Web Tokens. Thanks, Anne. Um, yes, uh, that's, that's the trend I'd like to highlight. And um, we, it's a trend that we've been seeing for uh, a couple of years now, and um, but we're making uh, we've got some really key milestones happening this year that um, that we're looking forward to. So, the migration to JSON Web Tokens by Science Projects is uh, having a big impact on those science projects, and and we're we're doing all we can to support that support this migration in a way that's. Um, that's uh, reliable and continues to provide uh, the, the operations of the scientific cyber infrastructure that the, the scientists are depending on as the, as the change is going on underneath. Um, so any sort of change to the, the security infrastructure um, is, uh, can uh, be potentially disruptive and we're doing all we can um, uh, in the CI Logon, partner, uh, CI Logon project in partnership with these other science projects to make that as seamless as possible. And uh, so in that, uh, in this transition, we're able to retire legacy security software like the old grid security infrastructure, uh, realize benefits like implementing least privilege auth authorization for improved security. And because we're standardizing on uh, uh, a well-adopted uh, web standard, the JSON Web Tokens, it's um, allowing us to enable greater in interoperability between different scientific cyber infrastructures. So the CI Logon project is taking action to enable this, this trend and this, uh, this migration by supporting different flavors of JSON Web Tokens um, from the, the GA for GH version, that's the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, to the SciTokens version, the WLCG uh, version, that's the Worldwide Large Hadron Collider Computing Grid, and also a nice um, RFC that's um, that's uh, giving us a common profile uh, that's not specific to science, but uh, we're also adopting. Also, because many scientific applications and interfaces are not in the browser, but they're on the command line, or there are uh, other types of apps uh, supporting the OAuth device flow, has been real key, really key for CI Log on supporting these different use cases. And then co-manage is the backbone for us to, to manage these authorizations uh, in a consistent way so that the scientists get access to, uh, uh, to the, the infrastructure that's key for them. Uh, and so uh, uh, the key question is, um, uh, are there unmet needs on your campus for identity and access management? Um, uh, for the science projects that are happening on your campus. If so, a CI Logon uh, may be able to help support those through our um, uh, identity and access management um, uh, platform. So here I want to quickly highlight one case of this trend that we're seeing. This, that's for LIGO, the, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, which is the U.S. part of the International Gravitational Wave Observatory Network, or IGWIN. That includes uh, CAGRA um, in Asia, uh, Virgo in Europe. And uh, what CI Logon is doing in partnership with LIGO is providing a dedicated token issuer. And through that dedicated token issuer, then we can control the namespace because uh, 
the all the tokens are are issued uh, only for Iguan use, and uh, then the tokens are um, issued to uh, HashiCorp Vault and uh, an instance of that software that's uh, being operated by LIGO for the observatory network that provides advanced token management for the different scientific workflows. And those workflows include HD Condor um, and uh, Segment Database and, and uh, Grace DB and, and uh, Data Find and, and, and uh, Data Management Services uh, in collaboration with the, the uh, the OSG Data Federation and others. So this is enabling us to implement the that least privilege using token scopes, uh, supporting long-lived workflows through refresh tokens, and we're doing all this in preparation for the next observing run for the instant uh, for the instrument that's um, happening later this year. So I've got some references there for you, um, including the SciTokens.org website and the CI Logon. JWT page that gives more details about our JSON Web Token service offerings. But without further ado, I'll hand things over to Deidre, who will talk about our next trend. Hi, everybody. I'm Deidre Chamberlain, the CEO of Cirrus Identity. And the trend I'd like to speak about is um, something we're seeing across the country right now, which is a, a growth in grant-funded collaborative research initiatives. Um, that we think could be a real driver for the Federation um, space. So next slide. Um, in terms of just overall impact and some background, those of you who've been around this community for a long time may remember way back when federal grants helped fund the creation of this existing ecosystem, trust ecosystem, um, that's really geared at least has been historically to large R1 schools. Um, and you know, there's a huge growth in that over the years. Um, NSF funding really helped uh, build some of the software that enables that kind of collaboration through in common. And um, now we're at a stage where there's a lot of smaller schools that might be interested in participating. The federal grant funding was targeted towards building software that enabled IDPs largely to get into these federation environments. The federal funding that we're seeing now when we're out in the field is going to uh, regional networks, regional statewide systems and collaborations where uh, the government is trying to fund resources that they would like to have be used collaboratively. There's things called CC star grants. There's a DART grant in one state school. These are all focused on shared research, uh, research um, tools like HPC clusters or um, data aggregation systems where multiple schools can take advantage of those. The challenge is that a lot of the smaller schools, number one, they're very under-resourced. Number two, they, they haven't participated in this environment before. They don't really understand even what the whole multilateral federation means. And so I think there's a huge opportunity for, um, for in common, for these research collaboration partnerships, for the regional networks to all work together to take participation in the federation to a whole new level. In order to do that, you need a combination of things. You need organizations that can register their identity providers in a trust framework. And to that end, Cirrus offers a product called our bridge, which makes it easy for schools to just connect like their Azure AD or their uh, Google workspace accounts to the Federation. Uh, another thing you need are tools that can help you share those research service providers with lots of identity providers. Since so many service providers only know how to talk to a single enterprise identity provider, like you would do in a commercial environment if you were letting your employees in, uh, we have a proxy that can allow you to connect your service provider, your research collaboration platform to lots of identity providers that are in in common or educating for that matter across the world. Um, and of course, there's also just educating some of these incoming participants about what all this stuff means and why it should matter to them. Next slide. Uh, in terms of key questions for higher ed institutions, I think there's uh, you know, the R1 schools can be thinking about what could we do to help some of these smaller schools get into this environment? Uh, and also what can we do to take some of these research collaboration platforms that we've been sharing with other R1 schools and expand that out to a wider audience? 
And then smaller schools are asking themselves, how do we actually get in here? How can we actually join uh, these, these efforts and collaborate? Our faculty, our students, how can they be a part of all of this? I think the biggest question is how can Catalyst partners like the ones you see on this call and Internet Tuning in Common work with uh, funding organizations like the NSF to take advantage of this moment in time and just really, like I said, expand the Federation and the extent to which people are collaborating. Um, in terms of project highlights, you know, we're hearing about these kinds of things going on, like I said, across the country, um, in states, in regional networks. There's a particular effort we're working on in one uh, statewide system where there's grant funding to provide a couple of HPC clusters, and the goal is to get access to those HPC clusters across a lot of institutions in the state. And so Cirrus is working on a project to run a proxy to protect those HPC cluster access. Um, and of course, we will consume Federation metadata. We will be aware of all the identity providers that need access. Some of those identity providers are already registered in common and we can bring those in. The ones that aren't, we're going to be working on setting up some of our bridges to help provide access to the Federation. So um, again, this is, we're actually starting to work on this one and we have calls about doing something very similar at lots of other statewide um, grant funded initiatives. And we look forward to working with them and also within Common Internet too, to, to try to really make, take full advantage of this opportunity. Um, I think that's all I have to say about our trend and I'm gonna pass it on now to Simona from Evolvium to do her trend. Thank you very much, Deidre. So um, one of the trends that Evolvium is focusing on is identity governance and administration as IGA principles have existed for a long time, but they might seem highly advanced and too far to reach in practice. In our opinion, IGA is something that can be deployed very early in the IAM project and for sure it should be kept in mind right from the design stage. So we could uh, go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, to start with the impact, IGA will help to get the complicated technical world of IAM closer to common users. And thanks to it, they will understand all the possibilities they can do by themselves within identity management. Like for example, managing access rights, requesting roles or approving such requests. Um, this will empower them to progress in their duties by themselves, which will significantly speed up processes within the organization, especially when you compare it with sending requests, uh, tickets to an IT department. And uh, moreover, at the end, this will save the effort of IT professionals who can be utilized more efficiently elsewhere. As an action, Evolvium is taken. We are well aware of the IGA trend and its importance. So Midpoint already contains IGA features for a very long time. But recently we are focusing heavily on the IGA topic, especially on the visibility part to be able to answer who has access where and why. Uh, we also have an internal working group, which is gathering use cases and designing IGA improvements for Midpoint uh, and design development capacity to implement ideas coming from the working group. So parallel with that, Evolvium is trying to engage with the whole Midpoint community, share the knowledge and help people adapt IGA principles. We can move to next slide, please. For the project highlights, uh, I would like to say that we always maintain and develop new features into Midpoint. And for past few product releases, Midpoint is ready to provide organizations with the full IGA experience to boost their security and efficiency. And this is also confirmed by Gartner's latest market guide for identity governance and administration, where Midpoint, our product, has been recognized as a complete IG suit already. So currently, our plan is to work on role mining improvements, also improving entitlements, ownership management, access request user experience, and some improvements to role definition pages, and many other useful IGA features. So um, according to Gartner's report, um, by 2025, over 40% of organizations will be using insights from identity governance and administration platforms to reduce security risks. And that's really important. Um, for 
the key questions to consider what should uh, you be asking maybe is how to integrate IGA principles in my IAM design at the initial phase of IAM project. So uh, IGA can and should be integrated to IAM project from the beginning. Therefore, in the initial phase of the project, people should ask what IGA features they need and how to incorporate them. The other one would be which responsibilities do you want to transfer from technical people to business non-technical people? So if you answer this question, it could help you outline your expectation from IGA. And what will be the main IGA component of yours? So with this one, especially in academia, IAM functionality is often uh, composed from several components and midpoint is designed to be the integration point which can provide the complex overview and enable governance, but it also supports expert options in case the IGA data are aggregated elsewhere. So it's important for you to visualize how the architecture is going to look like and what other components you might need to consider. So um, that would be all from me. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, and I would like to pass the word to the next speaker, Jim. Thanks, Simona. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Jim Van Landenham, the Chief Identity Architect with RAN Technology. Trend number four, prioritizing external IAM or client IAM services is something that we have been observing across many of our clients in the higher education space. A lot of professionals and service providers are starting to kind of rethink priorities, services, architectures, due to the significant changes in the higher education and IT space. A lot of business drivers that are changing, such as you know, non-traditional academic models, things like, for example, distance learning, non-degree programs, certification programs, research grants, et cetera. Um, higher expectations from those user populations, greater emphasis on digital transformation and just simplifying the user experience. That in conjunction with shrinking budgets and market competitiveness kind of require us to rethink the IAM architecture and kind of reverse the typical approach, uh, you know, that kind of prioritizes a start with internal sources of authority for identity information, kind of like, uh, you know, your HRMS, your student information system, your, your research system, and instead recognize that, you know, every user lifecycle starts with external IAM or, you know, client IAM services. In fact, research organizations, R1 universities, and pretty much most of the institutions we've worked with in the last year have, you know, recognized that traditional internal IAM doesn't necessarily address all the needs of the uh, external uh, people like affiliates or research identities, because it largely ignores how identity data actually flows from external sources. For example, most pr prospective students encounter and are entered into a CRM application using a social credential or a personal email address. Um, you know, everybody has some way of onboarding their students. Um, you know, for example, um, you know, this is also true of potential employees, parents, alumni, you know, other organizations in higher education all begin as and will eventually return to being external identities. You know, they'll, they'll graduate or move on or they'll, you know, become former employees, they'll retire, et cetera. So, you know, the trend we are seeing is that more and more institutions are beginning to prioritize IAM technologies, projects and processes that include the flexibility to provide services to everyone affiliated with the institution, not just you know, the traditional student and paid faculty and staff relationships. So uh, one way to exemplify that is during a recent CSP CIO engagement, one of the CIOs that participated mentioned how many of his projects at one time were stalled because of dependencies on IAM resources and services. They kind of joked that IAM had become known as where projects go to die. So this stems from both the tendency for organizations to view IAM as part of their infrastructure and a lack of awareness outside of information technology. And if you think about the digital experience, especially post COVID, it's kind of core to the relationship of, uh, you know, which institution maintains with its 
uh, affiliates and students and staff, et cetera. So I am as kind of core to providing a sufficient digital experience because it makes sure people have the account access technology they need to teach, to learn, and make sure it's there for as long as they need it. So barriers in the digital experience often point back to a lack of intentional strategy around a person's relationship with the technology they use or a lack of understanding between the doers in business and technology. So the best way to remove those barriers is to take a holistic approach to the digital experience that includes academic and functional, as well as IT involvement from all stakeholders across the university and not just you know, traditional staff, student, faculty, et cetera. So we have extensive experience helping higher education think strategically about IAM and providing actionable recommendations that enable the business outcomes of the university and help improve that digital experience. Uh, on the next slide, I have an example of that. So the project highlight I wanted to discuss uh, is a large state institution in the Midwest. They have around 50,000 students. I can't talk to them because I didn't get their uh, express approval to use their name, but they did say I could mention the project. So we worked with them throughout 2022 and we had dozens uh, of workshops and interviews. Their current IM environment was a product of, you know, and being underfunded and you know understaffed for years, the homegrown IM solution was inflexible, and you know it prevented probably two out of the three uh, university initiatives from being successful. You know they the projects went there to die. So although the core identity needs you know provisioning, deprovisioning for some of the traditional sources, faculty, staff, student uh, were being met. Anything outside of that was a really poor digital experience, especially for researchers, hospitals, and other external organizations like extension offices. Uh, so the solution, you know, was uh, basically riddled with technical debt. It was dozens of bolt-on components that were kind of made to solve a specific purpose, um, you know, one after the other, and then kind of brought together. So after com completing an IM assessment vision and strategy with them, um, a modernization program and staffing plan was approved for IM that will, uh, you know, help enable those projects to be successful. One of those being, you know, their diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative that was basically blocked. Um, so we started working with that institution in February to execute that strategy. I have a few key questions up there. You can ask yourself if you want to know more. You know, uh, just ask yourself those questions and think about, you know what you might want to do. And the point we're getting at is that I am as something you can't ignore until it breaks. Thinking strategically about I am and uh, communication holistically enables your institution to meet those needs of all of your constituents and improve the digital experience for everyone. And at this time, I'd like to turn things over to Stefan. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Stefan Fox here from Provision IAM. The trend we want to talk about right now is uh, managed cloud license fees. Now, last year in December, when we were at the Tech X, uh, we made some presentation in, in collaboration with uh, Cirrus Identity and Evolvium, in which we de demonstrated how you could provision Zoom licenses and deprovision them just in time. So after we came back, there was some discussion about, you know, what value would this have for higher education and institutions? And if we could go to the next slide, we'll talk about that. So we think that institutions can save costs, um, not just from just-in-time provisioning of cloud services, but also from smart deprovisioning of idle licenses uh, we got a lot of questions um, last year about, well, when do you, you know, turn the license off? So uh, we think some of the actions that have to happen here is uh, working out some business rules for when an institution thinks that a license can be deactivated, when it's not in use, and then implement that with a uh, midpoint and a smart connector that can make the difference between necessarily deleting the account or just deactivating it so it doesn't consume resources. Some things that you might think about there would be like, you know, Amazon Web Services or other web services that allow you to spin up a server for a few hours and then turn it back off when you're done. So some of the key questions around that is going to be, 
can the cloud service actually deactivate the license when it's not in use so it doesn't cost you even though you do have an account maybe a deactivated license doesn't have a continuing cost um, can the sso solution signal that a license should be deactivated or reactivated actually because you know if you deactivate a license and the user tries to use it again and finds oh it's not active how do we reactivate it automatically so that he doesn't even notice that he's lost some service? Um, what business rules and procedures will an instructor, will an institution implement to make the process seamless, understandable, and easy for users? So an institution really needs to think about, well, when can I deactivate and how can I reactivate? Next, um, next slide, please. One of the projects that we're working on um, for the benefit of higher education is what we call accelerated connected development. You know, one of our core competencies at Provision IAM is actually development of custom connectors. And so we've embarked on an open source project to develop a faster way to deliver midpoint connectors. And uh, this year we expect to provide improved base connector documentation, uh, open source artifact delivery. So, you know, you don't have to download the libraries. It'll be there, including the source code. You can just put it into your build system and it should work. Responsive fixes for identified issues. I mean, if we're gonna have something open source, we need to be able to support it. And then also cookbook tutorials. We have been using this base connector that I'm talking about right now for many years, and the developers know it very well. So <laughs> sometimes the documentation isn't um, necessary, but I think if it's going to be publicly available, we need to make uh, utilization simple. One of the other questions, I mean, this year, Provision IAM is a new Catalyst partner. I think we're in our first year of being a Catalyst. And so we're looking forward to collaborating with other Catalyst partners. The whole is often greater than the sum of the parts. We have different expertises that we can bring to bear that might help higher education institutions get a superior support and service. I think I'm gonna hand off to Sharice Arrowwood, Unicon. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen, and hello. I am Sharice Arrowhead, Executive Director of Business Development with Unicon. If you're not familiar with Unicon, we are a technical consulting software company specializing in higher education. My trend is modernization. So about about past two, two and a half years, this has definitely been a trend that we've heard of from our current customers and many prospects. We can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So modernization, modernizing identity technologies to enhance the digital education experience. That kind of says it all, right? That's a goal, that's what we want. Now let's kind of break that down. Let's talk about the impact. What do we want? We want to streamline efficiency, access and usability. Often when people hear that, they think, yes, that's what we want for the students. We don't want them to know that, oh my God, what is SSO? or MFA, or do I need to be in a group or a role, or how does this all work? If they know that, there's an error, there's a beep, there's a mishap. We don't want that. We want them to use the ITAP bundle that actually helps streamline their access. So what do they know? They log in and they get to the resources they need. But better than that, we want you to think of the other piece. We want you to think of the identity folks. We want you to think of those administrative uh, staff, the support staff that are going to update with patches and upgrades and um, need to be able to respond to the users of the applications. That's another great thing about that ITAP bundle is because they consider that. The ITAP bundle was built in the community by the community, higher education, which brings us to the next item which is remove customizations, right? A lot of people have customizations. Over time, you build up the needs and either other products aren't out there to support them. Maybe they're too expensive. Maybe time just gets away from and you don't even realize the enhancements that are out there and available, right? 
moving to products such as the ITAP bundle gives you the ability to remove a lot of customizations. That's something that needs to be considered when you're doing any type of identity modernization, because you want to understand each of those pieces to ensure that you're actually getting a replacement and upgrade and that your users are still getting the needs that they, that they require. Another big topic within modernization is actually that framework, right? A transition or migration from on-prem to the cloud or the initial deployment in the cloud. That's critical. We want to make sure that you're thinking about things overarching holistically, strategically. So you're starting with the framework of the infrastructure and working your way up. Unicom works a lot with Amazon Web Services as we are partners. We belong to the advanced partner networks. We can assist with ensuring that you have the redundancy that you need, the high availability, disaster recovery plans, et cetera. And that is again, core to modernization. Uh, gaining assistance outside. So again, unique to that ITAP bundle and the open source itself. Get some feedback and guidance from your peers before you decide when you're modernizing, where do I go? Who do I talk to? What's working? What's not? You have the community, right? So that's one piece. The other thing is the key staff that you have, put them to work on those priorities. Where is their expertise? What is your priority list? Let's marry that up. And in some cases, you don't have enough staff to go around, which is a common problem. Right, we've all heard it, especially the past couple of years. In this case, there's also the opportunity for strategic staffing, where others can come into your environment, become part of your team, which Unicon does often, to help you get that checklist down and get, you know, be able to assist those users with those things that they need, and really um, help you move on with those other priorities that you're concerned with. Now, action: How are you going to go through all of this? and really make this happen. It's very simple actually, as far as discussing what it is. And then the, the devil's in the details, right? So you want to assess and you want to evaluate. And what does that mean? You're gonna consider all the key questions of the topics that I've listed below. So we want to ensure that you are aware of what your goals are. As an institution, do you have sponsors, key stakeholders, people who understand the importance and the validity and the necessity of really enhancing or modernizing your identity and access management system? It's key to have those members involved. As you line up and identify those goals, have you also uh, collectively corresponded those with the key use cases? Have they all been identified? Are they prioritized? Do they actually link up to where you believe they link up within the IAM needs that you have? And then of course, staffing, because it's not just process, it's not just tools, but you need to again, look at the staffing. Where are you with staffing? Do you have maybe some great staff that's been around, but based on the modernization, perhaps moving to the ITAP bundle, you need some education. Bingo, they've got that available as well. So um, Internet2 provides that training of those different applications, as well as Unicon provides some support to assist with that knowledge transfer. Uh, but those are very key areas. There's a lot of detail to really to consume and to take time to understand. And to help do that, I want to really talk about the project highlight. So Purdue University, thank you, Mandy and team. You are fantastic. You're awesome. We've been working with them since early 2021. They actually started off with needing help just to get IAM tasks done, completed, so they could really focus on what modernization meant to them. So Unicon came in and did strategic staffing for them. As that list dwindled down, we then transitioned and we facilitated a very strategic identity and access management evaluation. That's where we come in and holistically uh, look at where things are today. We collaborated with the team at Purdue to understand where their system is today, what works, what doesn't work. We help identify the gaps and then provide best practices and next steps on how they move forward. Uh, the next steps from a uh, Purdue University perspective was to move forward with implementation readiness sessions. And those are very focused sessions that Unicon collaborates with the customer on, very products focused. So with Midpoint, that is completely done. And what we do is go in at that lower level and make sure that the questions are not just known that have to be answered at the application level, but actually are answered. And then Unicon goes in and identifies any gaps and then plans for next steps. That's completed. We're now moving on with the group or implementation readiness session, as well as uh, the implementation of Midpoint. So kind of an all around uh, example and a reference that they'd be willing to talk to anybody. But don't bombard them, we have other references. Um, next slide. 
think I'm getting close on time here. I wanted to cover this quickly. All of our services, as you can tell, that I've described are very much holistic and they drill down based on the need that we have, but they're very strategic, right? And Unicon likes to follow the learn methodology so that that way we collaborate, collaborate with you. We listen, we take it all into account. We then envision what are some ideas and thoughts to meet those goals and ensure that uh, you modernize in a way that's going to be beneficial for you and your institution. We analyze that, provide recommendations on next steps based on best practices and working knowledge and our hands-on experience, and then can guide you with uh, the roadmap at how to move forward to successfully modernize your identity and access management solution. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Netta at uh, Westerac. Thank you. Thanks, Sharice. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Netta Caligari. I'm community lead at Westeret. Um, and we are a software development company, not strictly an identity company, but our expertise does include collaborating with higher ed institutions uh, to build out software systems that work with your identity and access management infrastructure. So I'm going to be going through and talking um, about the last trend, which in different ways I think can impact um, the other trends that you heard from the Catalyst earlier, and that is increased customization of the user experience uh, specifically. And it's a little different than customization that uh, Sharice was just talking about, but particularly for that user experience when it comes to IAM. Next slide, please. All right, so to start, I'm going to start with the key question um, for all of you to think about. Does your software take full advantage of your IAM implementations? Hmm. Now, we do understand that it's a really big investment to improve um, IAM at your college or university. And with all of the really great work coming out of collaborations from in-common participants and others, um, we know that there's been really huge strides with modern, secure, and con consistent IAM solutions. However, that being said, we also really want to stop and think about if those institutions key software applications support that infrastructure um, and your metadata because when we're do when we were doing our investigative work and analysis around this issue, we did come to the conclusion that um, unfortunately a lot of software systems are falling short when it comes to uh, taking advantage of metadata and knowing how to fully utilize it. Um, a lot of times we're seeing that they're kind of stuck with kind of what they have and you have to figure out a lot of different workarounds and we do not want that. So an example of why increased customization in this instance is so important uh, is can be highlighted through a project that we worked on with Penn State Libraries to develop their open access workflow. Uh, Penn State needed a system to basically prompt authors to release their publications as open access in order to comply with university policy. And so this process inherently involved both IAM and research metadata, having that really symbiotic relationship with the application so that they could all work together um, and, and work for uh, what, the, what the user needed and um, uh, the team setting it up. And so we know that other universities have this challenge as well, again, partly in due to limitations with existing systems. Next slide, please. All right, and so the greater impact will come from greater integration. Our uh, development team um, kind of included everything from integrated authentication and basic authorization all the way through provisioning. And this proved to be really, really valuable when it came to ensuring that that application we were building could easily manage at a granular level the access to uh, journals and other information, you know, based on user identity, authorship, licensing, legal agreements, affinity, and so forth, like in short, their research metadata. So this use case with um, Penn State's open access workflow really demonstrated the need for that closer coupling between the institution's IEM setup, the research metadata, and the software that they were using to uh, basically make the academic world go around at their campus, right? And to really help them, we as a software company had to hold ourselves accountable to understanding these principles and understanding how all of this fits together within the application that we were building for them. Um, so again, in this way, increased customization for the win. And more so what really helps all of us is the continued commitment from this community to codify those standards and push the software industry to adapt with us and comply to these standards as well. All to say, we have the collective power, we have the collective voice to make these demands. So what we would love is for 
um, us to collectively with the capitalists and the community brainstorm around the ways that software can be adapted to take better advantage of your metadata um, and other elements of your IAM infrastructure, uh, rather than, again, the higher ed institution being left to figure out workarounds um, so that we can keep this trend moving forward. In conclusion, key points are, again, evaluate your user-facing software and where IAM might be underutilized for your needs. Um, if you've got the data, but the software can't handle it, where do you go from there? So trying to figure that out and evaluate that for your own institution. Discuss your findings with the in common community. Let's learn and share together. That's what we're here to do. Uh, work with your vendors that you're currently using to help them understand your needs um, and where there might be opportunities for better integration with IAM. And then, you know, again, there's so many resources that come out of this community with open source. So look for software that might be better adapted to uh, leverage your metadata. So again, big thank you to this community, fellow Catalyst partners, and of course the InCommon team for creating these spaces to cover these really important topics and trends for the new year and beyond. And again, we welcome continued discussion. So feel free to contact and reach out anytime. And now I will turn it over to Anne for Q&A. Great, thanks Netta, thanks everyone. So uh, now we have about, uh, I'm going to stop sharing. We have about uh, 15 minutes for um, Q&A. Um, and while um, you're thinking about what questions you might want to ask of these uh, very uh, talented speakers, um, I'm going to ask, I'm going to start out with a couple of questions of my own to just get us started. So um, one thing I noticed, and this was kind of like a, a romp through a lot of really important um, big picture uh, challenges that we're facing today and interesting opportunities. Um, one of the things that a, a, a trend or at least a theme, I should say, across a number of these different uh, presentations were um, kind of like a, a very complementary, as Netta was saying, actually complementary um, offerings from the, the various catalysts. And I just want to kind of highlight a couple of those and, and uh, get those folks to kind of explain a little bit more. And the, the first two that came to mind uh, were uh, Jim Basney's and Deidre's at the beginning. The, the, uh, the research-focused um, uh, access pieces. And I was wondering if, if Deidre or Jim could kind of explain that a little bit and kind of show us why they're very um, pretty complementary offerings. You want to go? You want to go, you want to go first? <laughs> Not to put you on the spot, but um, uh, well, no worries. I just think, um, yeah, CI Login does a ton of work helping researchers collaborate um, and access shared resources, and there's a wide variety of those and some of them are some of the more complex integrations that we have to deal with in the higher ed and research space so you know when it comes to a straightforward saml or open id connect integration um you know that's a lot easier than than some of the trickier integrations whether it's using ssh keys or moving to the jots that kind of thing that there's the cutting edge researchers doing things on their platforms where they want to collaborate in ways that we don't normally support as standard offerings so um, I think you know we need a combination of both, and it's probably good that we're um, we're we also collaborate a lot. The nice thing about the Calus program is we've gotten to know each other better. So and there's places where let's say Cirrus is running a proxy for SAML integrations, but suddenly something comes along that supports a non-SAML thing. We can call Jim and say, hey, how can we work together to solve this problem, by, and vice versa. Yeah, I know uh, we're working together with Cirrus right now on a on a project where Cirrus uh, operates the identity provider and the multi-factor authentication. And then CI Login has the co-manage piece for managing the authorizations. And so the, the components are, are very complementary um, and uh, help us um, support the, the different types of research applications as, as uh, DJ mentioned, um, but also have those connections to the campuses where the researchers are connecting from um, so that they don't uh, have to uh, have another username and password to do their research, but they can use their campus credentials to get, really get that value out of the Federation. Yeah, those are really um, great points. It's, um, you know, Jim is focused on access in the, to the various, um, you know, services and uh, resources. 
data repositories, things that a research uh, project needs to have. And Deidre really focuses on getting the end users using in common federated access into the front door of that of that project. So it's a really nice complementary offering, especially for organizations looking to uh, provide that complexity in terms of the large project offerings, but then also, as she mentioned, smaller schools or um, less resource schools being able to access that and leveraging a sourced and outsourced uh, offering for that. Um, we um, had a one person comment on the uh, to to the um, to the speakers directly. It's a very uh, kind question. Uh, it says not a question, but couldn't post anything in chat. I just wanted to say the Common Catalysts are some of the greatest additions to the community. Thank you, as someone that's worked with several of you, it's great to be able to count on you. So you can't actually, you know, plan something like that. That's a it's an amazing comment and really appreciate it. And I'm sure the catalysts do too. That's a great idea. Great thoughts. Thanks for sharing. So another question. Um, this is one I, I didn't talk the catalyst about, but we'll see. Are there other places where you all have worked together to um, to address community issues and challenges? I know two actually. I can give an example if none comes to mind. Well, um, Provis and I am has been working with um, Evolvium as a value-added provider for a lot of years. I think um, more than ten or, or something close to that. So we've we've served a lot of customers um, using that solution, and it's turned out to be pretty good. I'll just add in a couple of things. Um, we're, we're partners with Evolvium, so we work really closely to understand um, not just their product, but really support offerings. And we work together closely to watch the community feedback and the growth that's really necessary to stay involved and, and really want to continue to use the, the product, which is obviously really, um, you know, headed thumbs up uh, the past couple of years specifically. But we're real excited to be uh, gold partners with them to be able to offer the consulting services. And I guess the other thing I'd mentioned, because of the conferences that IT puts on, which is phenomenal, um, the, the community exchange or the tech exchange and um, the other one that we just updated the name on, but it's a collaborative uh, meeting. Those are great forums that allow us to get together. And Deidre and I had some discussion on uh, some additional topics as far as looking at modernization and how we, um, you know, we see that there's a lot of talk and maybe some opportunity for additional uh, you know, networking and collaboration in the future. Yeah, one of the um, one of the projects I think that both Sharice and uh, Deidre collaborated on with us and the community is looking at uh, developing standards for hosted identity providers, um, and then uh, through in common having those self-attested, eventually tested, and branded as being um, essentially a good with a good housekeeping seal of approval, right? So it's so if you're looking to join the federation or you're looking to maybe move away from a solution that you have today, you could, for instance, take a look at the Uncommon website and see, oh, look, there are a couple of hosted identity providers out there that um, conform to the community requirements. So, so that's a, a program that we're looking to um, put out uh, in production this year and announce it to the community. Um, another question. So for, for those of you, and I'm gonna uh, poke at the other Jim and uh, Sharice again. So you both talk about um, modernizing uh, uh, campus IAM infrastructures and uh, seeing identity management when it's not done well, right? It's I, I love that you know where where projects go to die because of course when uh, individuals need access, need provisioning or deprovisioning from a particular service, if you're identity and access management, 
isn't following either your business rules um, or maybe isn't uh, written in such a way that the data is fresh or um, actually the, um, the connector is not working or maybe you don't have a connector um, and it's all done through uh, pretty old uh, code. It can be a problem. It can be a problem and, and introduce a lot of friction and a lot of downtime in terms of an individual's productivity. So I'm wondering, that's, that's certainly a trend that we're seeing too. I'm wondering, how do you start unraveling, right? I, I love that little graphic that you had at the bottom of your slides, Jim, but how do you start unraveling that ball of twine? Where do you start picking uh, at the, the end with, uh, with the organizations and start figuring out, you know, where do they go first? Yeah, I'll start with Jim. Yeah, so you know, it's it really comes down to talking to the people that are using the processes and technologies, and trying to understand, you know, what is the experience they're having, and you know, trying to dig down from there to find out what are the technical barriers, but most importantly, the things that are most often ignored are what are the business process barriers? Where is the communication failing in terms of what business wants to do versus what technology is providing? And I think finding that gap is the first step in unraveling that because if you present somebody who's in technology with a specific problem, they'll come up with a solution for that problem, but they don't necessarily take a step back and say, you know, this problem stems from the fact that we're being asked to do these three things but they didn't tell us exactly how they wanted them done. So we interpret it the best we could. So I think, you know, fostering that communication and taking a holistic approach to identity is really the only way that you can start to unravel that and then start to offer services that not only meet business requirements, but also are, you know, providing a digital experience that's better for the people that are actually using the technologies. Great. All right, yeah, solid. Go ahead, jump in. Uh, so a lot of overlap, I think, you know, very, very similar. And I think a lot of um, what Unicon likes to bring to the table in a, in a lot of what was already said is the experience, the hands-on experience with higher education and understanding some of the pitfalls, the gaps, the issues, the nuances within idea and access management that have happened because that's happened to many of our staff that have worked in higher ed. But it's, it's bringing about the right questions to ask so that everybody is inclusive that needs to be when you're having those discussions. So it's an overall, it is holistic, it is strategic, but it also then we have to look at the priorities. If something is like in the face, it's high priority issue, let's help resolve that. But then let's have everybody relax and step back so that we can really approach it in not just a holistic way, but in, a, in the order that really makes sense and what is priority and do we have the right players from the, from the institution involved so that we don't have any gaps on the end, right? Let's start, step back and plan it appropriately. And collaboratively, that's the best way to do it because once you get going, people open up topics that you don't even realize. But there is much more, it's not just the technical, like Jim said, right? It is the business process, it's the governance, it is, you know, yeah, the user over here, but it's alumni, it's faculty, it's staff, it's the inner workings of from the framework all the way up. And those are a lot of considerations. So collaboration is key. Um, and honesty and understanding what you know and not being too proud to express what you don't know and just getting to the end. I love that, just getting to the end. <laughs> that is so true. Success. <laughs> Success. <laughs> so, uh, okay, great answers to a bunch of really difficult questions. I'm going to share my screen again and uh, um, April is going to um, take us out. Thank you, Anne. Um, first, let me begin by thanking you um, and the Catalyst um, for an, uh, an enlightening and engaging program this afternoon. I, I know I speak for myself and the attendees when I say you gave us a lot to think about, um, which we appreciate. Um, before we go, I um, want to just remind you of a couple of activities that we have coming up at Internet 2. Uh, plans are underway for our 2023 Cloud Forum. And if you think you'd like to present, uh, Call for Proposals closes on January 31st. We also have In Common Academy Shibboleth training uh, coming up, um, I believe, which was uh, referenced here this afternoon. The deadline, the last day to register is February 10th. We'd love to see some of you in class. And also, uh, Class AWS Solutions 
uh, architect associate certification training. Um, that fifth cohort is starting uh, on February 6th. So just want to make you aware of some of those opportunities that we have available uh, for more collaboration on so many of the uh, projects and issues that you're working on. Uh, and finally, just a few reminders, um, next slide, uh, about today. Um, thoughts about today's program, please complete our Zoom survey. We really value your feedback. You can also reach out to me directly, April Motley, with your feedback. And want to let you know, we'll be back next month with another great webinar. Uh, we'll be hearing from the IAM team at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. They'll be talking about their modernizing their use of grouper and then beginning to do provisioning with Midpoint. Um, so we're excited to have them as our guest. Uh, and you too can be a speaker. So please don't count that out. If you have ideas for uh, a future I am online that you'd like to present or that you'd like to suggest a colleague to present, uh, please submit our online form to do that. And with that, I want to again thank our speakers and to thank all of you all for being here this afternoon. Have a great rest of the day. We'll see you next month. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.